Mm -hmm. All righty. Welcome, everybody, to tonight's stream. Uh, we've got a great talk in store for you all on Environment Art and Unreal Engine 4. We've got Dallas Trapeau joining us tonight. Um, but really, really quickly, before we get into that, um, I've got a couple brief announcements for everyone. Um, first of which, uh, next week on March 10th, we're going to be having an SGDA social night over Discord Voice. Um, so if you're interested in coming out to hang out with us, chat with us, you know, play some games. If you've got any cool projects to show off, uh, we'd love to hear from you, love to talk to you. Um, I know we don't host socials every single week, so this is a great opportunity to just kind of chat with your peers for a bit. Um, and then that's going to be hosted on our Discord. So if you hit us up, utdsgda.club slash Discord, um, we'd love to have you there. Uh, and then after that, we would like to remind everyone that SGDA will be hosting a game jam pretty soon. Um, for a whole week from March 24th to March 31st, uh, we're going to be hosting a game jam. So um, that is going to both uh, kick off and end on our Discord server as well. Um, so if you're interested in kind of practicing um, game dev and flexing your creative muscles and everything, uh, it's definitely a, a great event to participate in. And then finally, um, we would like to remind everybody that uh, the current Game Jelly prompt is new loot, and it's still going to be running until 11 a.m. on March 10th. Uh, so again, if you're in the Discord server, um, please look out for the Jelly FAQ channel. Uh, and you can kind of read up on the, the current theme, again, to kind of practice your game dev skills and, and really flex those creative muscles. We're really interested in seeing what you guys can create for us. Um, but that's it for all the announcements that I have for everybody. So uh, with that, I will kind of pass it on over to Dallas. All right. Hey, guys. Welcome to the chat. Um, thank you, Cameron. Thank you, SGDA, for having me. Um, so when figuring out how to do or what sort of presentation to put on. Um, you know, there's a bunch of really great resources for virtual production, um, for environment art and film and games. Um, so what I decided to do was focus more so on like a day in the life of an environment artist and some, um, and basically what I go through uh, and my process and hopefully some words of uh, engine for film and television. And a little bit about me and my journey. My name is Dallas. Um, I'm an environment artist at a studio called Happy Mushroom. And I am a self-taught artist, actually. Um, I started about 13 years ago with Cinema 4D and After Effects. And uh, shortly after that, I moved into 3DS Max, Maya, uh, played around with Real Flow, Speed Tree. I basically touched a bit of each and every program until I finally figured out the ones that worked for me. And I've been using Unreal Engine for about five years. Uh, fun, funny enough, actually, when it comes to me getting into Unreal Engine, uh, it was actually because I was trying to get a job as an environment artist in games. Uh, so that I kept applying to Naughty Dog. And uh, one, t one of the days uh, they got back to me and they essentially said, look, you know, your work's, they actually like gave me advice and they said, look, your work's good and all this, but you know, we're not seeing any game art, you know, because all of my renders were at the time in V-Ray 3DS Max. Um, so they suggested that I learn a game engine. So it was between Unreal Engine and Unity. And at the time, I just happened to land on Unreal Engine, which turned out to be the best decision because Unreal Engine is um, being more incorporated into the film industry um, today. Um, during this time, um, yeah, I was having a hard time finding work, so I began creating my own game, which I had a partner on. And from the inception of that to, um, to then me breaking into the film industry, that was about two years um, from creating the original concept and everything. Um, and that game actually turned out to be the portfolio piece that landed me my job. Um, and so about my portfolio, uh, here's just a few screen grabs. Uh, you guys are welcome to go to my art station. It's just artstation.com forward slash uh, Dallas Drapeau. Um, the top four are screenshots from uh, the game I was developing. Um, I did not make the character. I set up the shaders rendering, um, but the character is not uh, 3D modeled by me. Um, the bottom two was an alley. I did this for a uh, lighting tutorial. 
um, and a texture tutorial and the bottom is like a block out of it. Uh, so without the pipes and everything. And so uh, a little bit of advice um, when getting just, just as an artist is never stop growing. Uh, the industry is very fast paced and it's constantly evolving. A clear example is with virtual production. Uh, I mean, just a few years ago, the idea of using game engine for film and television wasn't really a thought outside of maybe pre -bits. Um, now it's sort of the latest technology that a lot of studios are looking to implement. So right now is a really great time um, if you're a game gamist thinking about maybe transitioning into film. Um, you know, it, it's it's a lot easier of a transition now than it ever has been. Um, after you graduate, also, uh, don't be afraid to continue learning on your own. Learn new programs, techniques. Um, there's there's been plenty of times, uh, even before I had this job when I was doing freelance work, that my knowledge of multiple programs really got me the job because uh, they might had needed fluid simulations. And it's like, well, I know I've been using RealFlow for four years, you know, and it's a niche program, but, you know, it, it got me the job. Um, challenge yourself. You know, you know what, what you're best at. Um, you know your strong points, your weak points. Um, sometimes just tap into those weak points that you might have and just see what you might, what you might create. Maybe it's creating stylized art, uh, and just challenge yourself. It, it, uh, really fleshes you out as an artist. Um, always stay humble. Uh, that's a, that's a good one, especially when you're getting, uh, into the industry. Uh, I'm, I've been, I haven't really met anyone with an ego, uh, fortunately, uh, everyone's always very humble. Um, nobody likes an egomaniac. Uh, so that's always a good piece of advice as well. Um, be tenacious and stay determined, uh, especially like getting out of school. Um, you might not land a job immediately. It took me 10 years, for example. Uh, like I said, I was self-taught. It took me 10 years to get a job. It's definitely... It's definitely not a path I recommend if you don't have to. Um, at least now there's like CG Master Academy and all these things to help you if you are gonna be more self-taught and wanna learn on your own. Um, I started back in 2008 when we didn't have those things, like a little bit of YouTube. Um, but tenacity and keeping that deterministic mindset uh, is what really will help you prevail. Um, there's also resources here, um, cgmasteracademy.com, rebelway.net is amazing if you're trying to learn Houdini. Um, Houdini is highly sought after right now uh, just because of the procedural workflows and everything. So if uh, it is kind of a pain to learn. Uh, so if you're, uh, but if you are more on like the tech art side, especially, I would highly recommend learning Houdini and uh, that's a great website. Uh, UnrealEngine.com uh, forward slash learn. Just uh, if you're not super adept at Unreal Engine, that might be a really good place to start. Uh, ArtStation, uh, Udemy, uh, Noman Workshop, and of course, YouTube. These are all great resources um, to have at your disposal. And just keep in your back pocket if you want to learn something new. And um, what I've learned is that there's always something to learn. You never stop learning and you never stop growing. And the ever-changing uh, landscape. Um, so the industry, uh, like I said, is very fast-paced. Uh, like I said, just a few years ago, Unreal Engine, outside of use for like previs, uh, wasn't really used. It wasn't really until, from my understanding, uh, John Favreau with, I believe it was Jungle Book, um, was trying to figure out a way to get realistic lighting on characters. And so he really fleshed out this idea of what virtual production is now. Um, you know, those rooms with big screens, um, I'm sure you have you guys have seen them. Um, it's funny actually, because I remember when the first season of Mandalorian came out and I think it was on like IGN or something and they posted about the new screen technology. And I remember looking at that and thinking like, wow, how do you, like, how do you even get a job doing that? And so it's just, it's just ironic that, that that's the space I work in now is, is in virtual production. Um, 
problem solving industry, this industry, uh, I always can, I've always considered my job problem solving, uh, cause it's usually like a client comes and says, we need to create this. How do we create this similar with how they created virtual production? They wanted to cast realistic lights and shadows on characters. I, uh, with the Mandalorian specifically, you know, he's very reflective. Uh, he has a very shiny armor. And so just shoot him in front of a green screen would have been kind of a pain because, you know, they'd have to comp out that green screen and it's just a whole other layer. So having a problem and finding a solution, that's really the industry that we're in. It's a very creative uh, industry, but at the end of the day, it's a problem solving industry. Uh, the impact of that COVID has had on the industry. Um, one, one silver lining of uh, COVID, I mean, COVID's been hard on everyone, um, but as far as specifically to the industry, there's a lot more remote work now. I think the industry is starting to recognize that remote work is a viable option. And so it also makes your job opportunities a lot a lot more accessible, you know, instead of, let's say you're in Texas or New York or Colorado, wherever, and you want to go work at like Sony Santa Monica, uh, you might not necessarily want to move to Santa Monica if you don't necessarily have to. Um, I, they're, they're just an example. I don't really know what their remote policy is, uh, but just as, as an example. Uh, so a lot of these companies now are are accessing remote work so and working from home is, is is it's really great especially if you have like a family like i have a daughter and so it allows me to be able to work but also be home and spend time with her and still raise her um and the implementation of unreal engine it's something i've sort of been talking about already when it comes to virtual uh production and because Unreal Engine is the engine that they use for virtual production, I'm not sure if they use if there's anyone that uses Unity or the integrations of it. Uh, I've used Unity like once, so I don't really have much information about that. Um, but Unreal Engine is becoming such a powerhouse of a piece of software. So if you get if you can get really good at Unreal Engine. I mean, it's just going to open up so many doors and um, and seeing as a lot of you are game development students or interested in game development, trying to get into the industry. I mean, it's sort of synonymous with learning the, the tools of the trade, right? It's one of those key softwares uh, that most of us have to learn. Um, my advice for learning a software like Unreal Engine, I'm, I'm sure all, all everyone here is already learning it. But uh, especially when looking for job opportunities is to really hone in on a key style, look, um, w whatever it may be, even if it's just like you're the best at making forests or you're the best at making cars or buildings, whatever it may be. Um, I would start out by initially first focusing on trying to be the best you can at something you're really passionate about, something you really love. Uh, for me, it's lighting and textures. I love just making the scene look pretty. If that's, that's my favorite thing is setting up the lights, making the textures look great, setting up the theaters. That's what I love to do. Uh, so that's always been my primary focus. Yeah, I can model. Yeah, I can do all these other things, but that's always been my focus. And so that's why I spend my most time. Um, and because of what a lot of my work tends to be is is uh, textures and lighting, uh, and what from what I can tell is studios want you to be really good at one thing, but be flexible enough to do anything they need of you, because uh, you might be on a project and you know maybe you, well, you might be a texture artist, but you know they really need someone to step in and model. I don't know, a, a chest or model this or that, whatever. Um, and if you don't know how to do it, you know, it just, it's going to give someone else the opportunity to, uh, to do it. And you always want to be the person that when called on, you're ready for that opportunity. 
uh, you know, it's, it's like that saying, um, luck is just when preparation meets opportunity. And so you always want to be prepared for whatever opportunities come your way. And um, I also mentioned, make sure it's something you're passionate about, because, you know, if let's say you're, you know, you're really good at one thing, but you're not too keen on it, you know, you're not going to want to be working on that for the rest of your life because you don't like it. So make sure that you're doing what you love to do. And I think that's just a good uh, life advice in general. Uh, just do what you're passionate about and don't give up doing it. You know, you will, you throw enough stuff at the wall, something's going to stick. So just continue ahead and push forward regardless of what anyone says or how the, you know, maybe you don't get the the first application or the second, the third, whatever. Just keep going. Just keep going because eventually it's going to happen. It's got to happen. You keep knocking on doors, someone's going to answer. Okay. And so what is virtual production? What does it mean for you? Um, so I've touched on it a little bit um, as far as what virtual production is. Um, what does it mean for you? It means job opportunities. It means now as like game artists, you are not beholden to just the game industry. Um, there are ways to segue into the film industry. Um, I did not come from the game industry, so I'm not sure as far as like if you have a job in the game industry, if there's any specific things to segue um, outside of just applying at these studios that do virtual production. Um, it does mean that you are now a multifaceted artist. You don't have to just be game or you don't have to just be film. Um, it's really opening up um, all these opportunities for us artists. Uh, uh, and when it comes to virtual production, um, I'm, I'm going to show you guys an environment that uh, I was working on. Um, and I'm going to teach you, I'm going to basically walk you through my, my process and give you a few little tips and tricks, uh, maybe a few like similarities between game industry, film industry, what are some differences, things to keep in mind, um, and organized structures and things like that. One thing to keep in mind, though, uh, if you're if you're looking at uh, the the slide I have going on, is I purposely put that photo on the right in there uh, bec because it points out one key point when it comes to virtual production is when you're in these LED rooms, uh, the lighting is more ambient. Like if you look at the one on the left with Mando, um, you notice that the lighting is more so diffuse. It's ambient. There's nothing too hard. Uh, that's because the screens themselves, from my understanding, I, I could be wrong, but from my understanding, um, the screens themselves don't project like a direct light uh, too well, um, which is why like if you look at the one on the right, you see their screen in the background has a hard direct and so what they had to do is they had to actually knock out part of the wall and put a spotlight to match the lighting. So, when you're working in virtual production or you want to learn more, um, what, what I'm going to show you is more like a practical guy, uh, what we do. Um, they're not things that you're probably going to implement today. Like after this, you're going to go make an environment. Um, but if you want to apply for a job specifically in virtual production, um, understanding these things um, will help you with your portfolio because you could show outside of just showing like beautiful screenshots, um, you could show more of like the tech side and you could really show the studio like an awareness of, hey, like not only am I a great artist, but I also understand how to create environments on the volume for the volume because uh, there is a difference. And I'm going to I'm going to get into that right now. Now. Yeah, it's it's at 1080. Do you want me to just drop it to 720? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so, uh, funny thing that actually happened, um, is originally I was going to show you guys this frozen lake sort of environment that I had, um. And I had the file somehow got corrupted. 
in all my years, I've never had this happen to me. And this happened last night. Um, so I actually built this out just last night with the exception of the floor. Um, this was gonna just be a piece of personal art. And all I had was this floor. Um, but uh, let's start uh, let's start going through this. So let's say you have a client who is, let's say it's a horror film. Um, so one thing actually that I want to show you guys is reference. Before I get into this, I'm going to show you guys. I'm going to show you guys reference building. Is it is it showing the pure ref? I'm just seeing your mouse. <laughs> just seeing your mouse. Yeah. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll just I'll just stream my screen. It's fine. Where is it? Change window. Yeah. So let's say. Can you see it now? Yeah, this works. Okay, perfect. So let's say um, let's say it's a horror film, and they want something sort of dark, moody, Victorian esque, um, and they have the shot laid out. There's two people. One of them's telling the other one some dramatic story around a table. There's chairs. There's a fireplace. Um, so as an artist, one of the first things we do is uh, we either will look at concept art that they might have. Um, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. And, um, and then we always go back to reference. And specifically for lighting and layout. So these were a few different references that I got from Woman in Black and Crimson Peak. And I, I got, actually got these on a site. There's a site called uh, shotdeck.com. And it's an amazing, amazing resource for references because you go in there and you can either search by tone, you can search by camera angle, you can search by movie, and it'll give you these like high quality, these high quality uh, screenshots. And so one of the first things we do is we'll come in here and find some references um, primarily for, as a lighting artist, um, I look for references particularly for lighting and how to get how to capture these sort of moods. Um, so you go through and sort of analyze it. And for me personally, sometimes I'll get different sort of tones. And <clears throat> when we ultimately show it off, I might, you know, suggest different sort of tones. Like over here, you have these cooler tones. It's not outside of this lamp. You know, everything's very blue or green, very dark, dingy. Uh, I really love, um, I'm a big fan of just like pops of color anyway. So I personally really love the cool but warm sort of look that these references um, these references have. And another cool thing you can always do is you can search for uh, palettes. I I can't remember this. I think it's like cinema palettes dot something. I think it's on Pinterest actually. Oh, here it is. I <laughs> here it is. Color palette dot cinema, right here. Um, but if you go here, it'll it'll pop up these like screenshots and have actual palettes. And this could be really effective when trying to really focus on a specific style or mood. Um, if you're creating textures, doing lighting, I mean, for lighting, you can come over here and just like color sample uh, these swatches uh, for your actual lights to get those exact sort of tones. Um, so that's always really important uh, as well. Now let me close out of that. Now let's get back to Unreal Engine window. Okay. Now we're back in Unreal, right? Okay. And so uh, with this set, I'll show you. So um, another thing also to keep in mind is uh, I, I saw a post recently talking about if are you really in can you really consider yourself an artist if you use like 
purchased assets or like mega scans, for example? Are you really an artist because you're not really creating it? Um, I definitely do think that you're still an artist, especially considering you work in an industry with deadlines. And just like with this, for example, um, mega scans and the Unreal Engine marketplace really saved me last night because uh, I was able to find a Victorian room pack and like these walls, um, these are all mega scans. So this entire thing is mega scans and an asset pack. And then just me lighting it and then setting up like some of these textures. <clears throat> um, but especially when you work in an industry that has deadlines um, and it's particularly the film industry, when you're creating something like this, for example, um, you might have, I don't know, the, let's just say three weeks. This set has to be turned over in three weeks and you have to create this. Um, it's going to save you a lot of time and energy if you could find like just a photo scanned couch or you can do the photo scanning yourself or if there's a photogrammetry team, that's always nice. It's going to be a lot quicker than and a lot usually a lot better looking if you photo scan it, as opposed to coming in here and like modeling this thing by hand. Uh, and then let's say you model it and then the client doesn't like this this couch. Maybe he doesn't like the studded leather and it has to be something else. Well, now you just spent like two weeks on a couch or a week on a couch that you have to throw away. Um, so when you're, it, it's great to know how to do these things. Uh, and that's something, of course, you learn in school. That's something that you know, I learned as well um, on my on my journey was how how to do all these things, and it's useful. And you need to honestly know how to do it because there are cases where, let's say, you're working on some fantasy movie or some sci-fi movie, or or game rather, and there's not you can't photo scan a, a spaceship. You know, you can't photo scan, you know, what whatever it might be. You know, so sometimes you do have to go in there and actually model it. And so it, it is something that you need to know how to do and doing the textures and all that stuff. Um, oftentimes we do do a lot of uh, custom textures. If it's not photo scammed, um, we, at least when looked at it, we might use like tile textures, things like that, um, triplaners and such. Um, but so let's go through and I'll break this down a little bit. So these right here on uh these are my levels and this is this isn't anything too secret fancy like yeah th this is um there's a bunch of tutorials on uh setting up persistent levels and sub levels um but it's a very good way to organize your thoughts basically and organize your set especially because sometimes you might have different sort of uh scenarios you know instead of this environment you know, maybe you have one version where it's like these women in these chairs. Maybe you have another one where it's, you know, yeah, it's all like disheveled. Maybe a ghost comes in and turns it upside down. So you have to have another version where it's all, you know, misshapen. So this really helps because you could just turn it on and off. And so when you're presenting it to someone, you can just cycle through and say, this is it clean. And then this is it as as if they haven't moved in yet is what it looks like. <laughs> um, so that's really useful. It's also right now I only have the one lighting scenario. But like real quick I can even I can this is gonna be super uh let's say oh I already have one. Super quick and dirty. But so let's say I wanted to make like a day one. Um and come in here and grab Directional light, skylight. I mean, this is super quick. But um, let's say this is the exact lighting scenario you, you planned on making. Um, so now, real quick, you have a day and you have a night that you can present to the, cl to the client. Um, this is really useful for look deving because sometimes, you know, sometimes the set doesn't quite look right in one lighting scenario. So it is something to keep in mind is that it has to look good in the day and it has to look good at night. Uh, they, you don't always have to make like a day and night, but uh, I do find it useful to have multiple lighting scenarios, um, even if just like a night, maybe I have like 
more lamps or wall lamps or something in a secondary one as opposed to just this one. Um, another thing I have set up is the assets from the marketplace that I got. Uh, I essentially created a sub level. And the way the sub levels work is I mean, you just come in here, create a level, and just name it. And then sub levels, you have your level panel opener open, and you just drag and drop. Um, but this is Victorian Room Zoo, which is just all the assets over here. So I keep it in the scene. This way, I'm not going through the content and searching for the asset and trying to remember where it is and all these things. It's, this is just a lot more efficient. And you know, it's just <laughs> oftentimes you need to work pretty quick and you need to be efficient. Um, so every little bit uh, helps. So yeah, so I mean, you just come in here and just like, and just like duplicate, duplicate, yeah, duplicate the sofa and just. This pack is weird though because the pivot points are kind of they're not centered, which I don't like. Yeah, this also helps too for uh, when you're blocking out the scene and you're setting up cameras, uh, which I have a few set up here. Let's say, let's go for like a closer one. Okay, let's say Shopee. Um, let's say they wanted, is there anything small over here? Let's see. Let's say, let's say they said, you know, this looks great, but I mean, they, they, they want something over here. They, they think it's a bit empty. They want something over here. Um, this also helps to have the asset zoo, so you can just like grab something from over there and you can just move it in position and then now it just adds like <clears throat> just adds a little bit there you go now there's a little table back there um and then when it comes to working with the volume this this is super basic so I, this is literally a cylinder with flipped normals um but to give you an idea uh so let's let's just say this is the size of the volume. <clears throat> Sorry. Let's say this is the size of the volume. Um, you bring it in. You want to. You want to be able to see, like, you know, how is it interacting? Is the volume placed properly? And also, is the practical set placed properly? Because everything inside they're going to have to build, and they might not have like a large budget maybe you don't have a for a rug so you know just just got to move that out um and sometimes also say let's say they didn't like the rug in the center right here they don't like the position so they want you to like move it back so you move it over here and they oh that's perfect I say okay cool so are we going to have a rug that intersects with the wall um so you know sometimes i mean they might be able to just cut it and then we have like a little rug extension but you know that might not be so uh <clears throat> that might not be so practical so when you're working in virtual production <clears throat> when you're working in virtual production one thing to keep in mind is this set has to be practical in the sense that it has to make sense and when thinking about like when they're filming and how they're going to utilize it, how's this space being used, what do they want in it, and what are the specifics? Um, for example, like this rug, uh, you generally wouldn't just bring in any random rug. Um, they might have one specifically that they're going to purchase or that they already have, and they would send you like a picture of it. And just for reference, you would put it in here. Uh, just so they can see how that rug is going to look hypothetically with uh, with the ambient light from this. And then, like I said, the uh, the lighting is important when doing this because when you're creating these sets, you have to think of logistics. How are we pulling this off? I think that is one. That might be one big difference between um, film industry and game 
is with the game environment, it just, from my understanding, just has to run properly. It has to look good. It has to fit within the narrative. Um, so there are criteria that it does need to fit. Um, but with this, you have to also, on top of all of that, keep in mind of how are we pulling this off? What are the logistics? What's it going to take to actually get this shot? And so if you're creating a shot, let's say, or actually, where'd that day go? Oh, got rid of it. OK. Let's say this, for example. Let's make it really dramatic. OK. So now we have, let's say they want harder light up, uh, coming from overhead. It's like a really, really, really bright moon, moon night. And uh, that moon is just beaming on them. And they want to see it. Uh, so you, know, you set up the light. Uh, you get the camera. The camera's blocked in. And I mean, this kind of looks cool from this angle. You get this sort of fog rolling in. Um, and, you know, they love it. It looks great. But the issue is when filming this, it's going to be difficult to just get these hard shadows like this. Um, so this is something where, you know, they'd have to understand that, look, we're going to have to take out a section of the panel, put a spotlight. And as long as they're cool, um, then, then perfect. I mean, you can still do directional light. There's just, like I said, some logistics that go into it. Um, and it's something to keep in mind when you're, if you, let's say, let's say after this, you want to, you really want to get into virtual production and you want to start designing sets that environments that not only look cool, but are something that could function uh, on a volume on a, on a virtual set like this. And these might be things to keep in mind, um, especially when, you know, let's say you're going out and applying to virtual production companies and, you know, you show them an environment, but then you also want to show them, no, no, look, I, I know, I understand, you know, at, at least the basics of general rules and some little tips and tricks for how to actually create an environment for the volume and things to keep in mind. Um, so these are things you can really showcase um, that might give you an edge over someone that might not know this. Um, another thing to keep in mind is intersecting geometry when working with the volume, intersecting geometry with the volume. Something like this is a no-go. That's not gonna, gonna work because no one's gonna want to, <laughs> to build out a practical couch and then cut it perfectly and then and then plus it's, there's like potential parallaxing issues at the seam right here. So um again, you know, if if you want to just like make your own sort of volume like how I did and just ju just to challenge yourself really if that's something you just um see if you can create an environment that could be shown, you know, on you know, on a show that might use virtual production. Um, these are things to uh, to keep in mind. Um, outside of this, I think that's just about everything I wanted to go over. I guess uh, another thing I can go over is um, when lighting this. Uh, let me turn this off. When lighting this, I was trying to match. Um, you know, those darker, moodier references that I was showing earlier. Look at those. There are areas where it is basically pure black, but a lot of it has a little bit of fill. And this is what I'm talking about when it comes to, like, how I call this a problem-solving industry. Uh, because the problem is, is that the skylight would fill the skylight. The skylight would fill it, but... See, I have it at 0.15. Let's see. So the skylight fills it, but then now I lose, now it's kind of flat. I lose that dark, moody sort of look I'm going for, that 
Victorian horror-esque um, fanciful sort of look I'm going for. Um, so with this, you want a little bit at complete zero. It's it's pure black and just a little lift. Like if you let's let's go to one of these angles. Let's go to this angle. Point one five. You see, it just gives a little bit of lift. And that's another thing is the uh, making sure that the practical set is proper. Well, ultimately, that's like one of the biggest goals. Of course, you want to have a beautiful scene in the background and everything, but you want to make sure that it's going to be able to be used for practical usage. Um, so the way I did that is I just went around and just added these point lights at with super low, um, super low values. But if you see, if I come in here and just turn these off, you see how now the the shot looks like it's missing something. I mean, it's there's a lot of work that could go into the set anyway, but now the shot is really, uh, it needs something. It needs a little bit of, a little bit of something to it. And if this was like a shot there that, you know, they might be using, I purposefully put the light right here at the wall because it sort of lines up with the lamp. Um, and so again, it's, it's uh, creative problem solving. So not only are you, you know, adding to it, uh, bringing the set more to life, but you're finding like sort of creative little, little subtle ideas um, and focusing on those subtle details because you have the environment laid out. Uh, so now it's what's that little extra thing. And so it's those little nuances that can sometimes, uh, sometimes bring it to life. But yeah, if I were to turn off all of these, uh, is this one too? If I were to turn off all of these uh, ambient lights over here, you'll see it's darker. It still sort of fits that mood. But the issue is now we're not really getting any light. We're, we're, we're not getting any sort of... I keep saying the word lift, but it that's really what it is because uh, the shot needs to be brightened up. And that's... Like if I were to show this set, I know immediately they would say, "Hey, uh, why, you know, why is that background black? It looks like she's blending in." So you need some contrast. Um, outside of that, uh, so that's a little bit of lighting tips for lighting your environment. Don't be afraid to use uh, like point lights. Scatter them around with super low values. Um, as far as Everything else, I mean, these assets, like I said, were like, this is mega scans, this is mega scans. Um, uh, this is a, I mean, I I just made this subdivided wall for vertex blending, which I didn't, I ended up not really even, not really even using, because it just, it just didn't, I mean, you could add a little bit of variation. And I mean, if you're not too familiar with like the Mega Scans tools, um, this is really just you select like two materials, surfaces, just select like two materials, come in and come in here and create blend material. Um, I also did it for the ground as well. Uh, it was basically the same texture and just just to add a little bit of breakup, a little bit of vari whoops, a little bit of variation to it. And so this it just again, this is my favorite thing to do is textures and lighting. So these are the things that I think about a lot when uh, when I'm creating environments is how do I how do I add that extra little layer of detail? And that is it for my presentation. Are there any questions? All right. Um, yeah, I guess we can go ahead and open up for Q&A. So if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the Twitch chat. Um, I guess in the meantime, I can go ahead and kick things off while we wait for some questions to roll in. Um, mm -hmm. 
so I guess I will start with um, if you could go back in time. I know you said it took a little while for you to really break into the industry. So if you could go back in time, uh, what do you think is the best career advice that you might give to your 18 year old self? Um, I would probably tell myself to to choose a different school because the original school I went to really disenchanted me. I, I was there for like three months um, and it really disenchanted me from just the education system. Um, I, I support school. I think it's valuable. I think it's it's a lot, it would have been a lot better. My path would have happened a lot quicker, most likely, if I had gone to school. Um, I don't resent it at all. Uh, when I look back and look at what learning on my own and taking those lumps and bruises and sort of figuring out my own path, uh, it taught me other valuable skills that um, that I don't know if I would have had otherwise. So I don't resent it, but I probably would have told myself to go to a better school like Noman or or something. Okay, yeah, that totally makes sense. Um, we do have uh, one question in the chat. Um, do you think that an environment made um, either entirely or primarily uh, from mega scans or like pre-made assets? Do you think an environment made from those assets would be usable as a portfolio piece? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, you know, what's funny is I actually, uh, I was on uh, Quixel's uh, Facebook group recently and someone asked this question and there's a big chat about it. Um, but I, I think so. I, I think it, in, in a way it depends how you are defining that piece. Um, of course, if you are saying like you made every asset, that's a bold faced lie. So don't say that. Um, but just it, you're an environment artist. Your your job, your passion is to create environments. Um, so ultimately, that's that's really the goal is, you know, how creative can you get? And I mean, you I mean, you see people post all the time of these like beautiful, amazing, like crazy pieces they make with mega scans. And yeah, and you know when you look at like Megascans Bridge, for example, or you go on their website, you know it's just the individual assets. So it's really your imagination, your creativity that's creating the environment, and that's really what your selling point is. Um, because I mean, let, let let's face it, you know, how many people, you know, can make can do textures? How many people can model? How many people? you know, can do all these things, you know, especially when like you're, you're going to school, it's like everyone in the class, you all are learning relatively the same thing. You're all are relatively at like the same level. Um, so what's going to set you apart is your creativity, your vision. So absolutely. Um, like, I mean, I, I would, I still consider myself an artist and I didn't model anything in the set, for example. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I do, model and i sculpt in zbrush and things like that um but but yeah you're yeah it's it's still considered environment art and you can still use it for your portfolio all right sweet i think that's definitely helpful um so kind of on the note of portfolios uh what skills do you think were important for you to showcase in your portfolio um in kind of your your job hunt that's a really good question um i think for me, for me particularly, I think what I think what edged me out um, when it or edged me in rather when it came to getting the job I have now um, that's that's something to ask my bosses. But uh, personally, what I think it is was you know like I said I was working on I was developing a game and we had a really large environment at the time and. Um, it, we had it running at like a hundred, I, I think it was in some areas it, it ran between 98 to 120 frames per second, depending on the area. Um, so my ability to optimize the scene and make sure that it's going to run because when the way this works, like with virtual production is they'll do like a VR scout. And so they're in VR, so it can't be running at 10, 15 frames per second. You know, it, it has to be running well. And so understanding how to optimize as you go, 
um, how to maintain a good looking optimized environment. Um, I think I think those are skills that not not a lot of environment artists focus on. Um, I think it's something that people should focus on more. It it can be kind of a pain, especially when you get into like uh, like the profiler and all that in Unreal Engine. And usually it's just as easy as coming in here and just going to light map density and shader, you know, those things. Um, but yeah, I would say, you know, keep your scene well optimized. Um, if you can show uh, a beautiful scene and show that, hey, this is running at like 120 frames per second, um, I think that's that's a lot cooler than just here's a beautiful scene because you might show someone a beautiful scene and it looks great, but you know, and they'll soon find out that you can make that scene, but you can't make it run for like for actual real time production. Um, so that's a that's a more of a niche thing to learn that I think is really valuable. Absolutely, I think those are some really good points. Um, um, so I guess you know, I'm also kind of on the note of you know looking for jobs and everything. Um, what uh, like networking opportunities do you think have been particularly lucrative for you? Um, for me specifically, um, well, when I was when I was freelancing, because the way um, for where I am now, uh, funny enough, they actually reached out to me, um, but that was through my art station. So art station, personally, I think is you you need to have it because everyone from like junior beginner artists to like senior environment artists at blizzard everyone's on there and so you know when these companies are scouting and they want to look for environment art that's that's a like a really quick easy place that they're probably gonna go on to type in environment art and then click on the ones that look best and if you happen to be one of those and you happen to be within a region that they can hire you from, uh, then you're going to get that call. Um, outside of that, uh, <laughs> you know, I feel like I'm more untraditional when it comes to networking because I, I like I use Facebook a lot. <laughs> I go on Facebook groups a lot, um, especially for finding like freelance work. Uh, there's there's like the Unreal Engine community. Um, there's uh, game art development. There's I mean, there's so many of them on Facebook, and it's a lot of communities of people trying to make games or trying to do this or that or the other. And there's a lot of people on there that uh, that are also looking for to hire people. And these people aren't always like, you know, Blizzard's not going to do you know, a, a job announcement on Facebook, most likely on one of these groups. But especially like if let's say you apply and maybe like Blizzard turns you down initially, but you still want to get more practice. You still want to work on a team. You want to build up your portfolio and you want to make a, at least a little bit of money while, while you're doing it. Um, going on some of those job boards, like those Facebook groups, you know, might be a useful place. Um, also me personally, I would just reach out uh, I'm, that is one thing that being self-taught, uh, I feel empowered me on is I very much go after it, you know? So like, I, I, I just, I'll, I'll just message people on ArtStation, on Facebook. That's how, like for my game, that character that I showed you in that portfolio, uh, the guy who did it, uh, he was one of the character artists on a game called, uh, Senua's Sacrifice. And I got him because I just messaged him on ArtStation. And I was like, hey, you know, I love your game, love your character art. Um, and I'm not sure about reaching out about job opportunities to individuals that might work at a studio. Um, you might have some luck. Uh, I don't know if there's some sort of like etiquette when it comes to that, but uh, give it a try. I mean, what's the worst that can happen? I mean, I got. I got told no for 10 years until I got told yes. And that's all you need is just that one yes. All right, sweet. Um, so kind of taking a small step back, um, how do you think uh, having like an art station portfolio would compare against 
having your own portfolio website? I think it depends how well you market yourself. Um, before this, funny enough, uh, I that's what I worked in was uh, marketing and branding. Um, when it comes to having your own website, I would say if you are good at getting yourself out there, if you're good at um, really getting seen, uh, I think that can also be effective. I don't, uh, in my subjective opinion, I don't think it when it comes to if uh, a prospective you know studio that's looking to hire i don't think it necessarily adds or takes away credibility um when it comes to you have your own website or you just have an art station because at the end of the day all they want to see is that you do good work and you can get the job done um but if you are doing freelance work I guess that's sort of the distinction um, because I had I had my own website when I was doing freelance work and that's where I would suggest everyone to go. I'd reach out to people. Um, I would just like almost cold call places, see, hey, do you need this? Do you need that? And then that's where I would direct them is my website. Um, in cases for freelancing, um, I'd say a website is pretty useful to have, um, but also for also having your portfolio on ArtStation, I think, is, is valuable. OK, sweet. Good to know. Um, so kind of when you're trying to work on projects regularly, uh, how do you keep the creative juices flowing? Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, fortunately, fortunately for like the industry I'm in and um, I, I can't talk about the projects I've worked on, unfortunately, but um, but as far how do I say it? It's like the turnaround time on projects is quick enough to where it, it sort of keeps it going, you know, because we might be working on something that's I I don't know a fantasy, and then the next thing is like some gritty thriller in Los Angeles and then the next thing is this and that and so it's so that really helps because you're not stuck like I guess with a game for example um not it or or anything like that but I can imagine like when I was working on my game we built one level it was a giant level but in two years we built one level and it was hard towards the end to stay motivated on it because it's like I'm looking at the same lighting all the time. It's the same style of assets, the same this. So, so luckily, this industry and the turnarounds and all that um, projects um, and the variation of projects really, uh, really keeps things fresh. And outside of that, also. I'm very competitive, and so um, so I always have it in the back of my mind, like like someone else is doing that, like someone else has the edge over you, like you you have to keep pushing. Um, that that might just be that like uh, um, that uh, doing freelance for so long and being self taught is that idea that like there's someone out to get you. <laughs> so I always have that in the back of my head. And man, if you think there's someone out to get you, that that'll really light a fire under you. Yeah, yeah, no, I totally understand where you're coming from. Yeah. Um, already. Well, I've got uh, one last question on deck uh, that I can ask really quick. We'll kind of give it a minute, see if anything else uh, filters into the chat. Yeah. Um, but I guess as we start getting ready to wrap up, I got a good question. Um, mm -hmm. you know, kind of on the note of just keeping things fresh in general. Um, mm -hmm. I know you're working out of Unreal Engine, so kind of with Unreal Engine five, you know, kind of uh here and on the horizon um how do you think next gen engine tech will kind of impact your work moving forward oh man we, everyone is so excited like i i keep i <laughs> we, we all ask like when's it coming out when's it coming out it needs to be here already because yeah um so one of the things is um right now unreal engine has the 
capacity for what's called final pixel, meaning meaning like if I have this set on the volume, meaning that the studio shooting this isn't going to have to do any additional work. It's just good as it is. We send it. It's final. It's done. Um, it can in some cases. It can't in others. It's really um, you have to have a very good team, uh, which fortunately we do, um, to do consistent final pixel. Just because of the natural um, facts to an engine, you know things have to be optimized. You know you can't have like five billion polygons for like the you know, and you can't, you certainly can't scatter that tree multiple times. Uh, uh, limitations with ray tracing and frame rate, things like that. Um, so there are natural limitations when it comes to working in a game engine that we do have to keep in mind, which is why I brought up how optimization is important. Um, but I think, I think honestly, it's only going to get better. And I think the advent of like Unreal Engine 5, for example, and, you know, hopefully they stick true with their promises when it comes to, like, Nanite and all those things, and, you know, it's, like, having, like, billions of polygons and triangles and stuff in the scene, um, because if if that's the case, then that would sort of release a lot of the limitations that have as environment artists, um, especially trying to make things look photo real, because sometimes you need those high poly counts to make something look real unless it's far off in the distance. Um, so I think it's really going to, I think Unreal, I think the guys over there at Epic are really just changing the landscape um, when it comes to film and television, um, games, games also, to be honest. Um, so between Epic, they're putting behind their engine and then just the film industry um because the film industry loves to reinvent itself and invent new techniques um you know just like with virtual production you know they had an they had a problem and they solved it and fortunately for environment artists like us that use unreal engine um for solution involves needing more of us <laughs> so so uh, that really opens up possibilities and opportunities uh, for all of us. And I personally am just, I'm sure every one of you are too, just super excited for that Unreal Engine 5. I'm excited to just see what games look like. Like, I don't know if you guys saw the new uh, Senua's Saga, that game trailer. Oh, man. Like, if that's what it looks like in game, like, that's it. Like, oh, that's going to blow me away. But yeah, sorry, <laughs> I went on a tangent. I'm excited. No, you're totally good. Um, I I kind of feel the same way. I'm really trying to like uh, keep an eye out on some of those new technologies and and stay up to date with you know what could be coming. Um, but it mm -hmm. it's definitely like really really exciting for sure. Yeah, and that that important thing too is as an artist is to stay up to date, um, continually be on the prowl for any sort of like updates like i i'm subscribed to unreal engine and quixel's youtube pages for example and it's like anytime they post anything it's like bam i see it right then um and stay on the cutting edge of that technology uh for example 426 has the new land mass and the new water system you know that might be to bring it full circle back to like challenging yourself what i mentioned early on you know it's it's a new thing and try it out because you might you know you might want get someone that wants some sort of ocean or they want an island or they want this or that. And plus, knowing the tools, being at the forefront of it really puts you at the forefront um, when it comes to going in there and doing the interview and applying and saying, look, the, breaking down everything that you know how to do. You already know all the brand new things coming out. Like You're right there with it. And so, uh, yeah, staying, staying on point, basically. Sweet. Yeah, I, I think that's really good advice. I totally agree with it. Um, but yeah, I guess I guess with that, I'm not really seeing any more questions coming in through the chat. So I think that's probably a really good place for us to kind of wrap up for the night. Um, so okay. unless you have anything else that you'd like to just say off the top of your head, um, I think we can kind of call it a night. No, I think I'm good. Just, um, just keep pushing forward. Just keep going. Um, just be the best you can be. And you, I mean, 
whether you get a job immediately after graduating or it takes you a year, two years, whatever, you know, this is your passion. Don't forget that this is what you love to do is art. You are an artist and you need to create. Don't settle for anything less unless you happen to come upon some new passion. Maybe pursue that if this isn't something you want to do anymore, but stick with what you love to do. Um, and that way you will, you'll never be disappointed. You'll all, when it comes to life, basically you'll, you'll never be upset with yourself. You know, you don't want to be that guy looking back saying, I should have just done this or that. What if I did this or that? Be the guy that does it. Be the guy or girl that did it. Um, that's, that's the advice I got for my closing statement. Awesome. Awesome. Um, well, thank you so much uh, for coming out tonight. We really appreciate hearing from you and giving a talk to everybody. Um, we mm -hmm. really enjoyed having you. So uh, with yeah, that, thank you for having me. yeah, absolutely. Um, with that, we can go ahead and wrap up the stream. So everybody, uh, thank you for sticking around. Thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, and we will see you next week on our server for a social night. Have a good one, everybody. Good night, guys.